Here's something that uh, is, is that's coming up for me that's actually brought me quite a lot of um, sort of relief in a sense, but also sort of maybe falls could could be interpreted the opposite way. Um, <clears throat> I've done a lot of research about what happens between lifetimes, and there's there's a lot there's sort of various evidence that shows that souls um, through through sort of uh, a council of higher dimensional beings, um, we sort of pick a life path and we sort of have these uh, agreed upon um, struggles that we will introduce into our lives in order to learn specific lessons. So you, you may like um, what happened to me, right? I had a traumatic brain injury mm. and knowing that sort of my, my higher self perhaps uh, planned that um, for for a lesson for my own spiritual evolution uh, helps me sort of or it, it did help me sort of not feel like a, like a victim mm -hmm. in a sense <clears throat> but then we get into territory of like well are our souls really planning for themselves to be enslaved or to be um, part of genocide um, because that that would be quite quite a and, <laughs> You know, it, it's it's tough to sort of understand. And, and the theory is, these people that may be choosing this are very advanced and are capable of choosing these things because they can get even faster sort of progress by going through such an extreme experience. Um, so, wh whether or not that's true, I just kind of want to want to see where wh what kind of response you may have to that. Well, so we see this. We see what this is like at scale in an inst institutionalized societal way uh, in Hinduism and the caste system and the idea of karma and um, the idea that, you know, whatever you're born into, this was something that you generated for yourself in the previous lifetime and that whoever's born into the Brahmin class or whatever caste, um, caste class um, generated that position for themselves in their previous lifetime. Now, it's an incredibly convenient way for the upper echelons of the caste system to apologize for their privilege and to convince the lower members um, to remain just where they are. <laughs> just stay where you are. And if you're really good in the next life, you'll. Uh, you know, you, you may ascend to one of the um, upper levels of, of caste. So you again have this problem, and, and yet at the same time, let's just say that maybe it's true, right? So let's just take the presupposition that, that there's a certain amount of predeterminism in life um, that has agency somewhere in the interim between lives, which is your your theory, where you actually choose your life path in between lives, or let's say in the Hindu in the in the Hindu paradigm, in the caste system, where you kind of choose your next life by the behaviors of your present life. Mm -hmm. um, in either way, there's a sort of predeterministic um, setting for the life that you are living. And then let's just assume that's true. What that runs up against is obviously classism and economic predation and selfishness and enslavement and apologies for every kind of atrocity. Well, you were born into it. Well, you wanted to get raped. You didn't want to get raped now, but you chose to get raped in your inter, in between lives. You're like, ah, rape. I'll take rape and I'll take, uh... and obviously this becomes hyper problematic. So, but if we decide that that is the way, let's just, suspend disbelief and, and say that that is the way that the world works and it's problematic. That's the space I'm really interested in. And I sort of, I call that cognitive harmonics. And the idea of being able to hold more and more two conflicting ideas in your mind at once and sort of live in the distance between them and be able to aggregate aspects into sort of a center and an amalgam that is able to contain uh, and even potentialize and activate both um, considerations at once. 
so you know i mean very basic examples of this are like um uh masks don't work 100 percent, but they do work a little bit it's like oh my god no if they don't work 100 percent, then covid's fake or what, whatever cognitive dissonance everybody is suffering from um there's either god or no god the the, the binary what if there's God and no God? Um, are we able to start to see these things in the sort of holistic framework, the emergent framework that they actually exist within? All reality is sort of happening at once. And, and I think that there's exercises we can do. I'm actually starting to, to put together these cards, these cognitive harmonic sort of cards hmm. where you look at a card and you're like, you know, um, this person is red and blue. And then you put that card back or like, I am beautiful and ugly. Ah, my brain's breaking, you know, but like these, these contrary concepts to be held in the mind at the same time until, and you can only put the card down once you, once whatever it triggers has subsided. And then you just repeat and, and get to a place of calm within the living space between two contradictions. Um, but until we can sort of think from that place, I don't think that the world of epistemology, metaphysics, I don't think any of it is going to yield much um, until we get comfortable with the, the epistemology of confusion, of I don't know. This, you know. this isn't just the most spiritual emoji, the shrug. It's also the smartest emoji because mastering that, that state of like this and, yes and, this like both and, mastering that state, I think is fundamental to wisdom. And, um, you know, as again, similar to what I was talking about, the, about the pendular swing, um, we can fetishize truth so much that we lose track of sort of the bigger emergent truth and, and and the sort of dialectic between non-truths and, and all these sorts of things. Um, so that's, that's sort of my view on, on what you said. I think that it's, it's beautiful. Uh, it makes some sense to me. Um, and, you know, it's true and it's false. You know, there's, there's a false application of that. There's a, there's a get out of jail free card that we can apply using any kind of um, theory. And the ability to hold you know, our greed and our um, virtue um, in our minds at the same time is, is, is very difficult. We want so much. I mean, I've experienced this in my own life as an artist, being a, a punk rock, like post-punk, ironic, sardonic kid, like I was telling you, and then going, flipping over to like earnest. And that's my new punk rock is to be earnest. The gatekeepers of cool fucking, they fucking, hated that i mean the, the kind of reviews that i got from you know massive publications um didn't even review the albums they just fucking bashed me for being untrustworthy he was this and now he's this he's a fraud mm. meanwhile i produced the album we, we produced the albums ourselves we never had a fucking makeup artist or a or a anyone dressing us we made all our videos ourselves for the most part we 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 were completely like unprofessional we didn't have a look like we were just hip we were hippies but like <laughs> you look at Jack White, like I remember like a, a Jack White show and I, I was like, how was the show? And people were like, oh, it was great. All the girls were dressed in red and all the guys were dressed in white. I was like, I was expecting to hear something about the music, but, but no, it was great because it was so curated, put together because it was so not because it was so professional because mm -hmm. it was so forethought because there was so much uh professional sort of manipulative rhetoric and thought put into how to make an audience feel good and be really compelled by our show let's really think about what we can do in this show to manipulate the audience into loving this set Aside from the music, the music can't stand on its own. We need to do something that's going to sort of wow the audience 
with a light show or a thing or, or you know, a, a meat suit, like a Lady Gaga meat suit or whatever, whatever you're going to come up with to distract the audience and make them feel like they're really watching something spectacular is not fake. What's fake is someone who thinks that they're earnest. That's the thing that we have to watch out for. And suddenly this Edward Sharp band comes along and it's saying that it's this earnest, real hippie thing, but we all know nothing's fucking real. We're all post-modernist realists. And we know that anyone who's trying to be earnest is full of shit. We'll only trust the people that tell us that they're full of shit. We'll only trust the fucking, you know, leather jacket wearing, put together manicured band as the trustworthy band. And we won't judge them for that. But if someone comes along looking disheveled and looking like they don't, you know, like they're not uh, <laughs> put together and the, and the album sounds like shit because they produced it themselves, we know that that's the ruse. We know that that's the thing we can't trust. And we caught so much shit for that, especially because I was coming from this previous life um, as this like, you know, ironic whatever. And that emphasis on find your brand, not just as a band, but as an individual, who are you? Find, find out who you are. This emphasis on reducing ourselves to an irreducible chunk of like a core of, of immutable self. Whatever happened to the fucking Whitman, I contain multitudes. Whatever happened to the idea of universalism, you know, of the idea of, of, of empathy, which is the sense that you can actually feel into the embodiments of others. Um, it's, a, it's a highly unspiritual state to be like, this is me and I'm immutable and this is just who I am. It doesn't allow this. It doesn't allow God in. It doesn't allow the universe to flow through you because you figured it all out. And I think that that's why in a lot of ways, epistemology, knowledge stands in direct opposition to, um, to wisdom. I think that knowledge stands in opposition to wisdom a lot mm. of the time. Yeah. 